With that, let's get started. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the last chapter in this epistle. And our text today will be verses 4 through 6. I'll have you turn there at this time. And once you do, if you're able, if not, that's all right. But go ahead and please stand. That way you can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul is uh, writing very passionately. Uh, I suppose you could say also very emotionally, <laughs> uh, very candidly, very bluntly to these uh, Corinthians and says, verse 4, For to be sure, he, speaking of Jesus, was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves, verse 5, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course... You fail the test. And verse 6, I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Let's pray, if you would, join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, it's clear that we have before us a very interesting passage of scripture and it's one for which we desperately need for the Holy Spirit to minister the understanding of it to us. Lord, we need for you to show us what it is that you want us to see in the text that we have before us today. So, Lord, will you speak, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, today's teaching is going to be part two of a series I titled, uh, What True Love Is and Does. The Apostle Paul, in advance of what will now be his third visit to the Corinthian church is warning them about the purpose of this trip and he's very specific in telling them how he will come and perhaps more importantly what he will do when he comes in his dealing with these Corinthians. As we just read and as we're about to see Paul, true to form, doesn't pull any punches. If you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you've come to appreciate this about the Apostle Paul. But true to form, the tone he takes is both harsh and blunt and rightfully so. He has to. He needs to. Now, some may have a problem with Paul's posture towards the Corinthians such that they could get the wrong impression and see him as being angry with them when in fact he does this because of his love for them. It might be too simple, but everything that we're going to see here today in our text comes down to one word. And that one word is the word love. Love. If Paul didn't have this love for them, he wouldn't bother writing to them. And certainly he would not take the time and travel in those days was very difficult he certainly would not have taken the time to plan this third visit with them. It's for this reason that Paul says what he says, and it's also for this reason that Paul says what he says the way he says it. One of the things I'm learning in my 
walk with the Lord is, especially as a pastor teacher, is that oftentimes it's not so much what we say, it's how we say what we say. I think of what the Apostle Paul wrote about having all of our words seasoned with grace. I think about his letter to the church in, at the churches in the area of Galatia and how he in chapter six said, you need to restore that one gently, lovingly. Be very gracious in rebuking someone or confronting someone when they are in sin. So I see this as the Apostle Paul rising from the pages of our Bibles as an example to us of what this kind of love actually looks like. Simply put, Paul loves them enough to speak this to them. In love, because of love, it's the truth in love. We found our first one in verses one through three. And it's that true love, if I truly love, I will speak the truth to others. Here, Paul, in love, and again, because of love, very bluntly tells them that when he comes, he's going to deal very severely with them, so much so that he will not spare those who sinned earlier. This ties into our second one, and it's what we're going to look at today. In addition to speaking the truth to others, true love is honest with others. In verse 4, Paul says of Jesus that just as he was crucified in weakness, yet lives by God's power, so too Paul, when he comes, will likewise deal with them in that power, in the strength of that, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you have to understand that there were those in Corinth that were accusing Paul of being weak. And certainly Paul would boast in his weakness because when he, like us, are weak, then we're strong in him. Weak in ourselves, strong in the Lord. And so he's going to deal very strongly and very powerfully in that power with them. In verse 5, he says to them to examine themselves. And this is really interesting to me, and I want us to really take the time on this particularly. But he tells them to examine themselves, to uh, test themselves, to see whether or not they're really in the faith or not. The implication being that they were certainly acting like they weren't really, truly Christians. And so, rightly, he's questioning it in as much as he's saying, you need to question yourselves. You need to examine yourselves. You need to test yourselves and see if you're going to fail that test, because if you fail that test, then that means that Christ is not in you. And if Christ is not in you, then neither are you in Christ. You're certainly not acting like it. In verse 6, he goes on to say that he trusts they will discover that he himself, speaking of his own <laughs> test of his own life, He's not failed that test. He's in Christ. It's as if the Apostle Paul is saying to them, I'm in Christ. I've passed the test. Have you? Have you? Wow. If this sounds like Paul has the audacity to question whether or not some there in the Corinthian church were even saved, that's because Paul has the audacity to 
question whether or not some there in the Corinthian church were actually saved. I'm not trying to sound cute or coy. This actually is a good question that needs to be asked. And this answers an often asked question concerning the examining of oneself as to whether or not I am truly a Christian, born again of the Spirit of God. Let me say it this way. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking myself the question of, am I a truly born again Christian? That's actually the test. And there's an answer to this test. And thankfully, today's text answers that and even another often asked question of how we can know for a certainty that we or someone else is truly born again. A number of years ago, I actually had somebody ask me this, and I found myself kind of scrambling a little bit to try to answer the question of how do you know if you're really born again? How do you know if you're really born again? And in my way of thinking, and this is just kind of how my mind is wired, and I know they probably have clinical terms for how my mind is wired, but I just went to the very simplicity of the comparison of being born spiritually to being born physically. And I'll explain what I mean by that. There's no doubt, I mean, you know when a baby has been born physically, right? Especially mommy <laughs> knows because that baby that has been born craves mother's milk. And as that baby begins to grow and grow teeth, then that baby goes from being a baby to a toddler and they start chewing on meat and solids. And then that toddler grows into a child of God that grows into, hopefully, a man or woman of God, maturing in Christ and growing in grace. And that's how you'll know. I mean, that might be an oversimplification, but that's how you know when someone is born again. Now, what about where Paul refers to this test? Is there really a, a test that we can give ourselves and use to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are truly in the faith? Well, Adam Allen Ridpath explained it this way. To examine yourself, in fact, is to submit to the examination and scrutiny of Jesus Christ the Lord. And this never to fix attention on sin, but on Christ. And to ask him to reveal that in you which grieves his spirit, which, if you're born again, is indwelling you. To ask him to give you grace that it might be put away and cleansed in his precious blood. Self-examination, I love this, takes the chill away from your soul. It takes the hardness away from your heart. It takes the shadows away from your life. It sets the prisoner free. I suppose the question becomes, okay, what is the test? And how can we know for a certainty that we are truly born again of the Spirit of God. Last week we took a tour through Scripture, and this week I want to take us on another tour through Scripture. And this time it's to answer this question, and I want to start with what Jesus said concerning one being born again. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus said to him, speaking of Nicodemus, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Okay, and of course Nicodemus goes on to question the Savior concerning how can one be born again? You can't go back into your mother's womb. It's of course, speaking of the physical birth, and Jesus answers and says, no, this is a spiritual birth. You're born again spiritually. Paul writing to the Corinthians in this second epistle back in chapter 5, verse 17, says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I like that better than some of the other translations that render it a new creature. I don't want to be a creature. <laughs> I want to be a new creation. Regeneration. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your desires are new. You no longer desire the things of old. You now are a new creation and you have new desires and you desire the things of God. You desire and crave the word of God. 1 John chapter 5, by the way, we're going to be in 1 John back and forth. You might want to, I would certainly encourage you to turn to 1 John. Really the entire epistle is just fabulous. But the Apostle John in chapter 5 of his first epistle, verse 12, says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that, and this is key, please listen, that you may know, know, that you have eternal life. I like to call this life assurance. You have the assurance, the blessed assurance. You can know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. In chapter 3 of 1 John, verses 14 and 15, we know that we have passed from death to life. We do? Yeah. How? Watch this. Because we love, love the brethren. He who does not love his brother, abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Please, take this one word, love, and from that, view everything we're about to see through that lens. The lens of love. It all comes down to this one word, love. If I'm truly born again, I am truly in Christ, and he's in me, it will be evidenced by my love. By my love. And that's what we're going to see through this lens of love. 1 John 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay. And everyone, and here it is, who loves him, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. What? In other words, if I'm born again, I am going to love God and the begotten of God. Interesting, right? Is that not John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish,
but have everlasting life? Come on, pastor, this is a firm grasp of the obvious. Is it? Is it? Perhaps you, like me, would allow the Holy Spirit unfettered access to the deep recess of your heart, that he might search your heart, search our hearts, to see if there be anything at all that would keep us from knowing him and loving him. And then allow him to put his finger on it, identify it, and then remove it. That which has taken up residence in your life that has no business being there. John goes on to say, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Don't get weird on this. We're going to come back to what he's saying here. He says, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hang on. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Let me say it this way before we go on to verse 9. There's an inseparable connection between knowing God and loving God. Knowing God and loving God. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent him sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then he says it again in verse 11. Beloved, this is John, the apostle of love. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, I lost count, but I don't know how many times he uses the word love and links the word love to knowing God, to being born of God. Love, love. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus is speaking. Here's the warning. Beware of false prophets, like the super apostles, the false apostles there in Corinth who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. How do you know? Oh, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. That's how you'll know. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 
Uh, how do I know that's a, an apple tree? Oh, it has apples? That's how. I know that's an apple tree because it bears the fruit of an apple. I, please know that I have no intentions of insulting anybody's intelligence, but it's really quite simple, isn't it? Th this is how you're going to know? Jesus says, you'll, you'll know by the fruit that's on the tree of their life. Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? What kind of fruit? I like how one said it. We're not judges. We're fruit inspectors. We don't wear the robe of a judge. We wear the badge of a fruit inspector. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, well, we're not to judge one another. Wait just a moment. Not so fast. We're to have good judgment. We're not judges, but we're to have good judgment, and we are to inspect, examine, if you prefer, the fruit. And not just in the life of another, but really in my own life. What kind of fruit am I bearing in my life? Would you be surprised to know that there's actually one fruit? There's only one fruit. Well, wait a minute, I thought, Pastor, there were the fruits, plural, of the Holy Spirit. No. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. It's singular. Paul writing to the churches in Galatia does not say, but the fruits, plural, of the Spirit. He says, rather, but the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is what? Love. Love. Listen, we're not going to get away from this word love. It's there at every turn. And it needs to be. That's the fruit. The fruit of love. Now, from the fruit of love comes joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. Is not the law fulfilled vis-a-vis -vis love? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, the first five, and love your neighbor as yourself, the second five? Is that not the greatest commandment that supersedes the law? even fulfills the law? Think about it. How can I have joy if I don't have love? Let me take it further. If I have not love, how could I ever experience peace? If I don't have love, it's not peace, it's turmoil. And certainly if I don't have love, I'm not going to be long-suffering. <laughs> and if I don't have love, how is it possible for me to be kind? And if I don't have love, there's no goodness. There's no faithfulness. There's certainly no gentleness. And there's absolutely no self-control. They all come by way of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Love. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. What? Hang on. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Why? Because he has been born of God. Wait a minute. 
Is this saying that we can be sinless? Absolutely not. This does not mean that we will never sin. What this means is that we won't continue to willfully sin by deliberately disobeying God. Why? Because we love Him. When I was a child growing up, my mom in her thick accent would always say to me, Wahido, if you loved me, you would obey me. I'm like, I must not love my mom because I'm such a disobedient, rotten child. What she was saying was, when you disobey me, you hurt me. You hurt me because I love you. When you love God, you don't want to do anything to grieve him. You don't want to do anything that is going to hurt the heart of the one you love. I love my wife. And whenever I do something or don't do something, which is not very often because, of course, I'm a perfect husband, such a godly man. Is there a lightning bolt coming down anywhere there? <laughs> um, <laughs> but what really hurts me is to know that I've hurt her. I don't want to hurt her. I love her. I don't want to hurt her. I want to do anything that is going to hurt her because I love her. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, John's going to clarify this now, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John 13, verse 35. Here's the bottom line in closing. And I say all that I've said to simply say this. By this, Jesus said, all will know that you are my disciples. By what? If you have love for one another. Here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. We need to be honest with ourselves. Do I have this love? Does someone see me as a Christian because I have a fish on the back of my car? Which, by the way, I, I will never put anything on the back of my car because I'm so afraid I'm going <laughs> to... Never mind. <laughs> Do they think I'm a Christian because of the size of my Bible? Do they see me as a Christian because I go to church on Sundays occasionally? <laughs> Is that how they are going to know? No. There's one way to know, and this is the answer to the test. This is how they're going to know that I'm a JD, a Jesus disciple, a disciple of Jesus. It's going to be by my love for one another. That's how. Show me a believer in and follower of Jesus Christ who's born again of the Spirit of God and I'll show you somebody who loves. They love. Let me take it one step further and we'll close. Please listen. <clears throat> the one who's been forgiven of much loves much. And this is where the love comes from. And when you think about how much God has forgiven you of, 
because of his love for you, his unconditional agape love for you. And you've been forgiven of so much. The response is to love much. That's where the love comes from. You've been forgiven of much. And so, as a result, you will love much. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the simplicity, yet the strength of this passage. Lord, I thank you for the much needed reminder of love being the gauge by which we are measured in our relationship with you because you first loved us. Lord, may we as a church, as a body of believers, be numbered amongst those of whom it can be said, my, how they love one another. One thing that could be said about them, about him, about her, is that they love. They love. Lord, may that fruit be ever so abundant on the tree of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.